Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Michael Wong, Dr. Michael Wong from Azusa Pacific University. I am an associate professor there and also the founder of PhysioU. And I'm excited to be with you and very thankful to be invited to speak at your association annual conference. So I wish I could be there with you, uh, but I'm in the middle of teaching and preparing for many big conferences, but I'm very excited to share with you um, about how to use technology to improve your practice using guideline-based practice and active implementation. So how many of you have seen patients with low back pain? So I imagine everybody in the room can raise their hand because low back pain is a very, very common problem. It is the leading cause of activity limitation and work absence throughout much of the world and has a, it's very expensive for companies, for patients, because it is oftentimes very disabling. So the question then becomes, why should we use the guidelines to try to enhance care? So this article from 2010 talks about adherence to clinical practice guidelines for low back pain in physical therapy. Do patients benefit? And what you see is that when therapists, when physiotherapists spend uh, or greater than 68% adherence to the guidelines, they are trying to put the patients in the right categories and use the right type of care, you find that patients disability decreases, patients pain decreases, and the number of sessions needed to get them better decreases. So their efficiency goes up. Now this study is tied talking about the use of the Dutch physical therapy and manual therapy guidelines for low back pain. Another reason why this is an important talk for us to have is active is more important and better than passive guideline implementation, meaning it's very hard to read about all the guidelines by themselves. There is methods that we can use, like this education session, discussion, playing out patients, giving feedback during clinical training, and using reminders that can help physios do a better job of treating patients. So here in this particular article, they talked about how when therapists, physiotherapists did active implementation, they actually chose the right number of sessions for low back pain. They knew about how much time it would take to get patients better. They also set functional treatment goals, set functional treatment goals. They often used active treatment instead of passive treatment. So getting patients to exercise, to move, instead of just get massage or only manual therapy treatments, that it was actually a way to get patients active again. And these physios often gave good, adequate education. So how do we evaluate and manage this complex problem? How do we apply the science from all this research the clinical practice guidelines summarizes all the best research, and this guideline is refreshed every five years. We look through the research to find the newest data to help physios practice better, to make better choices. These uh, guidelines are a collaboration between the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy as well as the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. So today, what was once just a PDF, an article, journal article that you have to read, today you can actually look and use apps to begin to learn and see how to treat these types of patients. So that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time doing today. I want to talk about the key concepts, the key ICF, International Classification of Functioning, uh, disability and health, that these particular categories are how we, when we train students and we train clinicians, physios, 
we ask them to think about these main categories. Okay, and we're going to talk about each one. So low back pain and mobility deficits. If you see this patient, many times they have localized low back pain. And the main thing I want you to think about is if it is stiff, right? If their back cannot move and they're complaining of stiffness, then we need to think of ways, use manual therapy and exercises to help them move better. So some people are stiff and they just need a little bit of help to get the joints and the tissues to move better. So this is the, cat, the category from the guidelines. But here we're going to use the app to show you what these different things are saying. So let's play. All right, so we are in the PhysioU app. We are going to choose the orthopedic app. There are a number of different apps that you can use later. Neuro, patient education. But first, we're going to talk about orthopedics. And we're going to talk about low back pain. So we're going to choose lumbar. You can either look at pain patterns. So you can see many types of different patients that we see. So many of these types of patients with stiffness in their low back may present with pain like this. And you see that one of the top categories here is low back pain with mobility deficits. So patients that cannot move enough, their joints and their tissues are stiff. So you can watch the patient. You can look at the prevalence of these types of patients. How common are they? All of it's linked to the abstracts, the research. So you can see it's linked to the abstracts. And you can watch a video of how these patients might move. So you can and see this patient with spondylosis of the spine. has good movement to the left, but when he sides bend to the right, the pain gets worse. He's limited in his movement. Extension also makes him worse. So based on the guidelines, when you suspect that a patient who has a disability in life cannot function because they cannot get enough range of motion, then the main things you need to examine are here in the key findings. So what you see here is a clinical reasoning video that you can watch. This is an instructions clinical reasoning video. And you can look at the techniques that you would use to assess range of motion. So these are all videos. With the patient standing with their feet shoulder width apart, ask the patient to bend forward, observing for available range as well as quality of lumbar flexion versus hip flexion. On the way back up, again you're looking for quality of return and extension of the spine versus extension of the hips. You can repeat this use an inclinometer at the sacrum and the other at the TL jump. So you can see that there are videos that will teach you how to measure the range of motion and you can see the different ranges of motion, rotation, quadrant movements, passive range of motion. So you're examining the mobility of the spine. And you also need to look at the accessory mobility. This can be the central PA or the unilateral PA and you are now assessing, is the tissues really stiff? It's valuable to also see that there may be other areas that you might need to assess. So many times when people have stiffness in their spine, they may also have limited range of motion in the hip region and also in the thoracic region. So you can see this is helping to develop your your clinical reasoning. Now, there's also differential diagnosis. What are some other areas that you want to examine quickly to make sure that the pain is not coming from this other, other tissue? And here are some tests that you can do to help to rule it out. And here is some of the research numbers. Sensitivity, specificity, likelihood ratios. So when we go in to think about treatment, so we go back here to this low back pain with mobility deficit. 
it could be degenerative joint disease, it could be facet syndrome, but here we really want to talk about the impairment of a loss of mobility. So when you look at the interventions, you can see that there's also a clinical reasoning video that you can watch and learn. But you'll see that the treatment is usually based around trying to improve the mobility of the spine. So this can be like a manipulation to improve lumbar mobility. And you see that there is, from the guidelines, strong evidence for using this type of treatment to improve the mobility of the lumbar spine. So you can see the manipulation set up. The instructions here are all here. The instructions on how to do the technique and the video also of the technique being properly done. So what you'll see then is the therapist applying a mob mobilization force so that they can enhance the mobility of the spine for the patient with a mobility deficit. So the patient's being set up properly. We take the tissue to the end range. Keep the body in a nice neutral posture. Begin to add some force and then there's the manipulation. There are many ways that you can improve mobility of the spine. You can also just use your PA mobilization. And what I want you to see also is that your exercises should also be exercises that often will improve the mobility of the spine. Now you can use these basic exercises and send them to your patient by email if they have email. So if you click here, you can now send email of the exercise to the patient and the patient will now get the exercise that they can use to help themselves. The last thing I'll show you here is that there's also patient education. Patient education is the things that you will typically tell your patients. Here's what's going on. Here's how long it will take. Here's what we are going to do in therapy. And this is some things you can do to, what you can do to help yourself. So there's always a patient education, okay? So remember, low back pain with mobility deficits, when someone is stiff and their functional limitation is related to a lack of mo mo range of motion, then what we need to do is improve the mobility using mobilizations, exercises, and education to improve the patient, okay? Okay, so now we are talking about the next category, low back pain and related leg pain. So these patients are complaining of... Okay, so now we are talking about the next category, low back pain and movement coordination impairments. These are patients who hurt themselves because they move too much at their spine and they move so much that they begin to sprain or strain muscles or ligaments, or maybe disc, doesn't matter. We don't know exactly what tissue is injured, but the reason why they're getting injured is because they're moving too much. So if the spine moves too much or too far out of neutral, right? If the spine moves too much, you have to train the body to maintain the spine in neutral. Teach the patient to move at their hips, not at their lumbar spine too much. So in the guidelines, this is low back pain with movement coordination impairments. So let's look at the app and see how it goes. So we're back into the apps. We're choosing the orthopedic app. We're looking at low back pain. You can look at pain patterns, but you can also look at the different diagnoses. So I want to look at 
lumbar muscle strain or lumbar instability, people who move too much. So let's take a look at this type of patient. So this patient says, the common lumbar sprain or strain. So oftentimes they sprain or strain some tissue inside their back. And many times the reason why they're hurting these tissues is because in their job, in their posture, they are moving too much. So for this patient, they may be actually bending too much. So they hurt something in their back, too much flexion. But remember, some patients can have too much extension. Some patients can have too much rotation. In this case, it's too much flexion. So actually, they have plenty of range of motion. They're the opposite of the mobility deficit. They have too much motion. They move too much at their low back. So they are injuring their tissues. So what should I do for my exam? Well, I still need to measure range of motion. I still need to see what directions are painful and how much can they move and how little can they move. So here are all your standard range of motion assessment. Now the guidelines also says that when you do accessory mobility, so when you do your PAs, you may find that you can reproduce the patient's pain, but you may also find hypermobility, too much movement. One of the other tests that may be useful is looking at the prone instability test. So when you put a PA force, you can see the here, line prone off patient's resting, and you apply a PA force, it may cause the pain. But when the patient raises their legs, they're firing all the muscles, you press again and the pain is better. Which tells you when the muscles are active, when you turn on the muscles, it reduces the pain. That's why the treatment category for this patient usually is lumbar stabilization teaching the patients to maintain neutral spine. So when you look at the treatments, when you look at the treatments, you may see actually that the exercises that you do usually are teaching patients how to do neutral spine training, lumbar stabilization training, or correcting the way that they move. So you can see if the patient tells you, I flex too much, I bend too much, then you can teach them, okay, don't bend at your back, keep your spine neutral. So keep your spine neutral and bend more at your hips. So a lot of your exercises and training are going to be teaching patients to work on making their spine neutral, keeping their spine neutral and strengthening their muscles, and then teaching them how to move better, <clears throat> to avoid too much flexion or too much extension or too much rotation, depending on what they do in their work. I want you to remember that patient education is also very important. So always remember to come and study and read what to tell the patient. Remember to tell the patient, hey, sometimes when you move, you move too much. And if you move too much, that can cause injury to some of the tissues. Now, the, this, this can get better, but I need to teach you how to keep your spine closer to neutral for now while the tissues are healing. And then I'm going to teach you how to move better later. Okay, so here is all the education in the app. So now, let's talk again about a new category. Now this time you can see the patient has leg pain. Now the pain is not just in the low back, it's back pain with radiating leg pain. Radiating usually means that there is some nerve involved. So I want you to think, if the nerve is irritated, 
then I have to protect the nerve to allow it to heal. So I want to avoid movements or postures that compress or stretch the nerve. I want to teach them how to avoid that. Then when I treat the patient, I need to think about how do I decrease pressure on the nerve, reduce the nerve entrapment. Is it like a spinal stenosis problem? Or maybe it's a, a disc herniation problem? We don't know, but we have to listen. What movements make the patient better and teach them to be in those positions for now so that the nerve can begin to heal. And then eventually, I need to do manual therapy and exercises that help to decompress the nerve and also to improve the nerve mobility, so mobilize the nerve. So this is from the guidelines here, low back pain with radiating pain. Let's play. So we're back in the app. Here's the orthopedic app. Here is lumbar spine, and I'm looking at the pain pattern. So I'm looking and I see, oh, yep, this is the patient's complaining of this narrow band of lightning-like electric, electrical pain, sharp pain, burning pain. So you have several possibilities, maybe spinal stenosis, maybe sciatica. So let's look at spinal stenosis, okay? The possible cause of this type of pain. So what you see is that Many times this patient for lumbar radiculopathy will say my pain is worse when I'm standing or when I'm walking. So you can see the extension. Too much extension in the low back may compress the nerve. And maybe when the spine is changing, degenerating, there's not enough space for the nerve. So there's a stenosis. So what you see then spinal stenosis. is some of the movements, extension makes the leg pain worse. Okay, that's very different from a disc herniation where flexion makes the back pain worse, the nerve pain worse. So this is an extension sensitive nerve pain. So in the exam, we always assess range of motion. So the same examination you do before, we assess the range of motion. We want to measure which range is limited and figure out which movements make them better, which movements make them worse. And then we also want to assess the joints. And many times if the pain is on one leg, we'll all oftentimes assess central PA and also unilateral. Because I want to check where the nerves come, coming out, can I check the stiffness of the tissues there. Can I reproduce the pain? Can I find the entrapment site? The other thing I want you to think about is because we think there's a nerve problem, we really should do a, a neurologic exam. Your dermatome testing. Here's your dermatome testing, light touch. With the patient supine, have them close their eyes and assess sensation at L1, ASIS, does this feel the same as this? L2, medial thigh, does this feel the same as this? L3, medial knee. L4, medial calcaneus. L5, the inner web space between the first and second toe. S1. So you have to do a, a neural exam, the dermatomes, the muscle tests, myotomes, and then the reflexes. So this is how we examine nerve problems. And we also want to check the sensitivity of the nerve. So we can do a straight leg raise to see if we can reproduce the pain. Now, when we go to treat, okay, th there are many other things that you can examine. So if you go back here, there are many other things you can examine. Movement faults. How is this person moving? Does this person move with too much extension? I can correct that and reduce the compression on the nerve. So there are many things that you will have to look at.
but for now we'll just stay focused on the basic exam. Are there other areas that I should examine? Yes, of course, many of these patients are older patients, so I should assess the hip. Here are some things I can do, range of motion of the hip. I should assess the thoracic spine to see if there are any other problems above and below the, the lumbar spine. Now, when I go to treat, remember I said earlier in the interventions, so here we're in treatment, you can watch the clinical reasoning video, but usually we do something to improve the space for the nerve. We reduce the stiffness of the joints. So here is your mobilizations. Hopefully you are treating where the nerve is coming out. You can improve the mobility and the health of the tissues in the area. So your PAs. To assess yours, and apply a posterior to anterior force, assessing for mobility. So you see the PAs have a good strong evidence, manual therapy, and many times we'll do some type of stretch to open the space for the nerve. So lumbar flexion stretch. And then we may give them exercises to improve the nerve mobility and the nerve health. To improve neuromobility using a slider technique in a straight leg raise, take the patient's leg into hip flexion. So you can see the patient goes into a straight leg raise, but every time we raise the leg, we release the ankle into plantar flexion. And when we lower the leg, we take up the tension in the nerve because we release the tension in the hip. So we're doing this exercise to help the nerve. So you can imagine the home exercise program should be matching. I want to do exercises and treatments that help to open up the space for the nerve. Quadruped rock back, double knee to chest exercises, decompress the nerve. And then I want to make sure that the exercises I give them also include helping the nerve to feel better. So you can see they use the belt. And we are going to use some technique, some exercise to help to improve the nerve sensitivity and the nerve mobility. Okay, so this is the home exercise program. So remember always also that we want to have good education. So here in patient education, you can teach them, here's what's going on. Here's how long it will take. This is what we're going to do in physio. And this is what you can do to help yourself. Now let me show you one more thing. We have released a new app for you, patient education app here. Okay, so if you go back here, you can see all the apps, patient education, you can say, okay, I have a low back pain patient and this patient has spinal stenosis. I'm going to send him or her a special education that we wrote just for the patient so they can read about it, they can understand it because when patients can understand their problem, they have less fear, they have less pain, it can reduce pain. And so here you can email this article to the patient. Okay, so you just put in the email and the patient now can read the article at home. Okay, so patient education is very important. And this app has education for all the different areas, all the common problems. All right, so we are moving back now to the next category. So related leg pain. <clears throat> you can see that this leg pain is a little bit different. It's a little bit bigger. The pain is in more areas. It's a little bit more difficult to tell if this is a nerve pain or if this is a pain that's a referred pain coming from the disc. This type of leg pain 
usually needs repeated movements. The repeated movements usually in the directions that help to normalize good spine posture. This will help to centralize the leg pain. It's a lot based, it's based on the concepts of the McKenzie method. So here is your related lower extremity pain. Many times these patients, they'll tell you flexion makes me worse, rotation makes me worse. And it's because many of those movements affect the disc. And that disc we know can refer pain down the leg. So how are we going to treat this patient? Okay, how are we going to treat this patient? So let's go back to the app. I'm going to look at lumbar pain. I'm looking at the pain pattern. Now we know that the pain pattern is not very diagnostic. Many different types of pain patterns can have many different types of problems. But at least we know this is leg pain. Okay, below the knee, pain below the knee. So here you have acute low back pain and referred or related lower extremity pain. This pain is actually nothing wrong in the leg. It's just pain that the patient feels in the leg that's coming from the disc. So how do I assess this patient? What I want you to see is many times these patients have a posture that may have a lateral shift. They may have a loss of their, their back is very flat. Okay, it's, this is not uncommon. And so I want to normalize this posture and I will use repeated movements to normalize the posture. So I want you to look in the exam. The exam is essentially centralization assessment. Can I use repeated movements to see if I can make the leg pain move up, back, up the, back, up the leg, back into the back? So if you see the patient has a lateral shift, then you should do some type of lateral shift type of movements to see if you can correct the lateral shift. Okay? So you use the lateral shift movements and assess with multiple repetitions whether you can get the leg pain better. Or sometimes you might have to try extension. So if you see that the patient does not have enough extension, you may choose to use extension, repeated extensions, multiple repetitions. In a standing position. Okay, you can see here, the backward bend, you're restoring the normal curve of the lumbar spine and seeing if you can improve the leg pain. Move the leg pain up the leg into the low back. If the patient gets worse, the pain becomes more in the leg or new areas of the leg have pain, so you're producing new pain, then you have to think, maybe I need to do this same treatment, but I need to do it in a less aggressive position where the patient's lying down. So you may choose to put the patient on pillows and let them lay there for a while you may choose to do a lateral shift correction. If you see that there's still a lateral shift, you may need to correct if the patient is that position. So you can see the patient has a lateral shift. So we are going to shift the pelvis to correct the lateral shift and allow the patient to lay there for a little while. And eventually, we want to restore the lordosis so we can do repeated prone on elbow type exercise. So you can see that here. So slowly restoring the lordosis, always checking to see if the pain is getting better. Is the pain location changing, moving up the leg into the low back? Okay? So eventually, the patient's pain is no more in the leg. Maybe it's just in the low back. Now we have to go back and think, how do I prevent this patient from having this same problem again. Well, I have to look at their movement faults. I have to look when they move, do they flex too much? Do they sit with too much flexion? 
Do they bend too much? And I can do motor control training to teach them how not to bend too much at their lumbar spine. So this is how you use movement to treat the low back pain. Okay, so it's an active treatment, not a passive treatment. Okay, so we're done with the main categories. What I want you to now think about is the last two categories are low back pain and cognitive and affective tendencies. That means some patients may be depressed, may be anxious, may be fearful. These patients, when they are worried like that, they have a higher risk of developing chronic pain, becoming generalized pain, right? So they now have pain in multiple places that may or may not be related to the tissue problem, but their brain can become too sensitive. Okay, this is another topic for another time, but I want you to think about how any of the patients that we just talked about may have, sometimes you may listen to them and you find that they have some anxiety, some fear, some depression. You have to watch out for it and see if you can help them. See if you can get the other doctors. Maybe they need some medication to help with the depression or the anxiety. You might need to help them with different, different uh, healthcare workers to help this problem to make sure that you prevent them from becoming chronic pain patients. Okay, so you can look more about that in the app. So the last thing I would say here is that the importance of guideline-based care is that one, you can get better outcomes. You can be a better therapist. You can do your job faster. You can help patients get better faster, more efficient care. You will save lots of money for the patients. And because we are all using the same guidelines, we can now collaborate to do international research. The guidelines you can find here at the journal website, jsp.org. If I click here, I will show you that here at the JSPT website, under features, you have clinical practice guidelines. Here are all the guidelines. And all of these guidelines we have built into, these, into this app. So you can see the guidelines are all here, clinical practice guidelines. Okay. And I want to know, I want to say that we are so excited at PhysioU to support the therapist members of the Cambodian PT Association, the Cambodian Physiotherapy Association. So we are providing free access to all of our evidence-based apps to all the members. So it's important to become a member of your association so that you also can use these tools to help learn to treat your patients better. And the way that you do it is you go to physiou.com. So you go to physiou.com. You go to sign in here. You put in your email. We are sending you a welcome email with your email and your password. So you sign in here with your email and put in your password. And now you will have a new way of learning and using research with all of these apps. So again, I'm, I wish I could be there with you. I hope this is useful for you to think about how to use the guidelines to treat your patients better. And we're excited to be supporting the Cambodian PT Association, the Cambodian Physiotherapy Association. We hope that together we will be able to help patients better. Thank you very much. Thank you to the president of the Cambodian PT Association and all of its members. And we look forward to a great year using better research to treat patients better. You can always reach me at mike at physiou.com. Thank you very much.